we're going to break bread thinking about humility and taking some verses from 1st of Peter chapter 5. And we all want to be more humble, right? But how? There is no button on the side of your head that you can press to make yourself more humble. You can't put your hand on your head and push yourself down. You can't take a day off work and work on being more humble. And the answer, one answer to being humble is actually in the bread and wine that we've got here. In the things that they represent. The death of the Lord Jesus for me as the worst sinner. That ultimately is what humbles us. It is our engagement with the cross of Jesus that brings us down. So we want to be humble. This is critically important, as Peter is going to explain to us. And it is these things that we remember, the death of the Lord and his great salvation of us. That ultimately is the answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you because we love you and because we love all that we have seen and known in your dear Son. And Father, we seek humility realizing that this is of absolutely paramount and critical importance to you and to us, that we should be humble. Father, we are naturally inclined to pride. And we pray, Father, that we may take this seriously and be humbled by you and by him, by your love, by his grace. And we pray that you'll be with all your children, wherever they are, those who are not engaging as they should, with pride, those who are being led astray by the pomp and the power and the pride of this life. We pray, Father, that for all of us, we might truly engage with you and with your Son and with his death for us, and that truly we might be humbled and remain humbled for his sake. Amen. So, we're going to just focus on the three verses here from 1st of Peter, chapter 5, from verse 5. Yes, all of you gird yourselves with humility. Put on the apron of humility, is how the Good News Bible puts it, and that is correct. That's the idea of the Greek, and of course the allusion is to the Lord Jesus girding himself, coming forth and washing the disciples' feet. So, gird yourselves with humility, as with an apron, to serve one another. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your anxiety, all your cares upon him, because he cares for you. That's what I want to focus on, those, those verses. Well, as I said, you cannot make yourself humble by pressing a button or by taking a few uh, days off work to think, oh, I must work on my humility. It's not like that. I believe anyone with any experience of life in the Lord will have broken bread and thought, yep, let a man examine himself. Well, okay, yep, my pride, my pride. I must be more humble. And the problem is that we can, on, on a cusp of emotion, on a cusp of devotion, say, oh, yes, yes, I must be more humble. But how does that translate out into life? We need some abiding force that will humble us. Now, of course, we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, but God is also humbling us. So it's a case of getting with the process, uh, as it were. God wants us in his kingdom, but... We've got to come down so that we might come up. And that is one reason why life does not work out for us as believers. Life is not awesome and amazing and fantastic. So many aspects of our lives don't quite work out. Why is it that you got stuck in minimum wage employment all your life when guys you went to school with, who were not as hardworking as you, and frankly not as intelligent as you, uh, they went up the ladder. They're doing real well. Why was it that you saved up your money and, and, and got a property and then it burnt down? Why was it that you, as the faithful husband or the faithful wife, found yourself betrayed by your partner? Why? Why did things not just work out? And you can get caught up on this. What should have been? What could have been? 
what ought to have been, what might have been. And if you're a believer and your hope is set on the kingdom and you are working with God, yeah, then you see it. That sure, we've got to be brought down. And in a sense, it's a race to the bottom. Yeah? By the time you come to your death, you hopefully will have been brought down so that you might be lifted up. Not now. This is not the day of exaltation, but in the day when the Lord comes. And that's what we signed up for when we were baptized. You died with Jesus, went into the water, came up out of the water in exaltation, in resurrection with him. Well, Peter says in Second Peter that Paul, as in all his letters, writes some things that are hard to be understood, which the unlearned and unstable rest. Yeah, and I'm sure we've all looked at that and thought, yeah, <laughs> that's right, Peter. Yeah, Paul does write some pretty obscure things. But it's not a throwaway comment because nothing in the Bible is throwaway. Everything is inspired by God and is profitable. It's telling us something. And one simple thing you learn from that apparently throwaway comment is that Peter knew the writings of Paul. He knew them well. And one key, I think, to understanding the writings of Peter is to see that he is so often alluding to the writings of Paul. In fact, all through his writings, he's alluding to the gospel records, he's alluding to the writing of Paul. Under inspiration. And I just mention that and bear that in mind, because that is, I think, the key to understanding this. He says, verse 5, gird yourselves with humility, put on the apron of humility, that is, as a, a servant about to wash other people's feet, to serve one another. Well, he's obviously alluding to the upper room. And you remember it was Peter who resisted that, who said, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And the Lord says, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Oh, yeah, please. So again, Peter's own humility comes out here. Well, he's also clearly got in mind what Paul says in Philippians 2, where he says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself, who took on the form, the mentality of a slave and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And because of that, Philippians 2 says he was highly exalted. Actually, Philippians 2 is a hymn or poem at best. And there's seven stages of progressive humiliation unto death. That's point six, even the death of the cross, the final humility. And then he was exalted, and there's seven references to the different aspects of the Lord's exaltation. And the point is, let this mind be in you, Paul says, that was in Christ Jesus. His humbling of himself on the cross is not just an icon to be looked at from afar and say, oh, wow, wasn't he humble? This is you and me. He there in his death, whom we remember in the bread and wine, he is programmatic for us. That is to be our pattern, that progressive humiliation unto death. That when you come to your grave planks, you have been brought down low. And then the exaltation, the V-shape, if ever there was. So he has this in mind here. And so in terms of, well, how do you make yourself humble? Connection with Jesus. That is one aspect of it all. Well, he goes on to say, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And just let that sink in. God resists proud people. And who wants God against you? You see, humility is absolutely critical to God. Now that's out of Proverbs 3. And the Proverbs of Solomon very often allude to the Psalms of his father David. And in this case, it's a Psalm 84, 11, where we're told God gives grace. That's just what Solomon says. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to those who walk uprightly. And that's the point. He gives grace to the humble, Solomon interprets that as saying. So to walk upright before God is to be humble, is to walk stooped down as it were. But before God, this is the great paradox, that the true greatness is in humility. The man who before God is upright is the man who is humble 
in his own eyes. That is the point. Now, when he says, God gives grace to the humble, I said that he is very much alluding all through his letters to Paul. And in Galatians 2 verse 9, Paul says that Peter perceived the grace that was given unto me. Peter, Cephas as he calls him, perceived the grace that was given unto me. In the same Greek words. So when Peter says here, God gives grace to the humble, yeah, well, he had perceived that God, gives, God gave grace to Paul. And there's a, a whole load of times when Paul uses this very phrase, God gave his grace to me. God gave his grace to me. So I think Peter, in his own elusive way, is saying, look, Paul actually is the example. He was a man to whom grace was given because he was humble. Well, how was Paul humble? He doesn't always come over as particularly humble. He seems pretty quick at answering back, uh, even when he's on trial for his life. Um, well, he was given grace because he was humbled by his sins. And in Ephesians 3, in just a couple of verses there, in verses 2, 7 and 8, Paul says three times, Grace was given to me, I who am less than the least of all saints. So Paul felt that he was the worst possible sinner. It says in Timothy, chief of sinners. He felt he was the worst. And he says, even to me, was this great grace given? And Peter's, I think, holding him up as an example. Well, Therefore, he says, humble yourselves, verse 6, under the mighty hand of God. That mighty hand of God is bringing you down because he wants to lift you up. Humble yourselves under it. Get with the process. That is the idea. You know, don't get bitter and cranky that life didn't work out as it ought to have done, as it should have done, as it could have done, as it might have done. You know, that's all God's hand bringing you down. And get with it. Sure, this is the idea, to end your days right down, that you might be lifted up. Don't fight against it. Don't rail against it. Things hit us, don't they, out of left field. Illness. Your, par your partner, your wife, your husband having an affair. Your kids strangely betraying you in, in older life. Uh, stuff happens. You, know, you get falsely accused of something that you honestly never did. And there you are, you're condemned as guilty, and you've got to, got to take the consequence for that. You think, why? Well, yeah, here's the answer. God's bringing you down because he loves you and wants to lift you up, but you've got to come down. And so we don't rail against that. You think, uh -huh, yeah, 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 I, I see it, yeah. Humble yourselves under that mighty hand of God. So, <clears throat> humble yourselves that he may lift you up. I said that he's got Philippians 2 in mind here, where we're told that this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and then was exalted. So in those moments and those experiences, those parts of our lives where we are brought down, you are experiencing the essence of the Spirit of Christ, what he went through in his death. This is why we remember his death in the bread and wine and in life. Because this is the pattern that we shall be brought down, that we might be exalted in due time with him. This is the whole idea of being in Christ, that being in him gives everything perfect sense. If that is your number one self-identity, that I am with him, I am not an independent free operator in this world, I am in him, and he is my pattern. His path shall be mine. But as I say, it, it's hard to consciously do this to yourself. But as we see him there in our mind's eye, betrayed, misunderstood, covered in blood and spittle at the end, dying this awful death, the just or the unjust. 
Who cannot be humbled by that? But humility in reality, in practice, is shown in the context of our behaviour before others. I think he has in mind here a whole range of scriptures, but one of them is the Lord's parable in Luke 14, where he talks about the person who comes in and takes the best seat at the feast and has to be put down at the day of judgment when the, the master comes in. And he says, the Lord says, don't do that. Take the lowest, not a low seat, but the lowest seat, because he that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he says he that humbles himself shall be exalted in that context. So I think that that is getting closer to humility, not just the cusp of feeling that, oh, yeah, I, I am an awful sinner, and oh, what great grace I see there on the cross of Jesus for me. It has cash value. It, it has reality only really in the context of your mixing amongst men, and particularly in the church, because that whole idea that you have been invited to a banquet Take the lowest seat. Well, here you are. This is the messianic banquet as you break bread. And typically one does that in the context of others. You break bread with other people. And so we are to take the lowest seat, the lowest. Feeling like Paul, that I am the less than the least of all saints, but to me has great grace been given. God gives grace to the humble, resist the proud. And I think that is particularly seen at the breaking of bread. And it is, I think, within human nature to be tempted to say, ah, uh -uh, but he, this one is, he's an alcoholic. Uh, she, uh, I know she does drugs. Uh, he doesn't, I don't think he really believes. This is not the point. The fact you have all these difficult people there in the church is just background stuff to help you be humble. Just say, yeah, he's an alcoholic and she does drugs now and again and she sells her body now and again and he this and he that. And he doesn't quite understand this, that and the other. Okay, but I am the least of all the saints. I take the lowest place. And I have to say that all this stuff about a closed table, and oh, she can't come, oh, he's out of fellowship, no, 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 he's astray, uh, she's not living a moral life, she can't come to the, to the banquet. This is missing the point. Nobody who says that, who upholds those policies, has experienced, I'm afraid, this, I am the least. Where's the, oh, this is the Lord's table, where's the lowest seat? That's mine. Because it, it's totally natural to not do that. But you see, this is the outcome of being humbled. So then, <clears throat> another passage that I think Peter has in mind is the parable of the tax collector and the publican. And you remember the story that the tax collector will not lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beats on his breast and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Whereas the publican, the tax collector, sorry, the uh, but the Pharisee, rather, he prays with himself, saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other guy, a miserable sinner. And the Lord's comment is that everyone who exalts himself, that's the Pharisee, shall be humbled, but he that humbles himself, the tax collector, shall be exalted. And again, you, you get the idea that humility by the tax collector was shown in the context of his worship, was shown in the context of his relationship with another person. The tax collector heard what the publican was saying. And if I'd have been the tax collector, I'd have thought, wow, what a hypocrite you are. You're fake. How can you pray to yourself? Pray to God, mate. And what do you mean? Thanking God that you're not like me. Whoa, what a hypocrite you are. You're fake. And the guy was fake. But the point is that the tax collector, despite that hypocrisy in the church right next to him, still thought he was the worst. That's the point. Of course, in God's eyes, he wasn't. But in his own eyes, he says, God have mercy upon me, the sinner. 
I'm the worst sinner of the lot. Next to him, there's this self-righteous, hypocritical Pharisee. He's probably having affairs with women. He's probably financially crooked and everything else, morally crooked and the rest of it. And this guy's saying, nice and loudly, so the guy can hear, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this terrible man next to me. And yet, that tax collector hearing that says, God have mercy on me, the sinner. I'm worse than this guy. You see, humility is in the context of persons. It's in the context of our relationship with each other. That is where humility really comes out. And why was the tax collector humbled? Because he felt that he was the worst possible sinner, the sinner. Just like, take the lowest place. Because he that is, who humbles himself will be exalted. Just like Paul in Ephesians 3, I'm less than the least of all saints, but to me, who's the worst of all the believers, was this grace given. So it is conviction of personal sin to the point of really feeling, God, I'm awful, I'm the worst. That is the humility. But where do you get that conviction from? From the cross. That is one function of the cross of Jesus and of beholding it, engaging with it, which is what we do with the breaking of bread. That we are convicted of our sin to that point where you really think, God, I'm the worst. I'm really the worst. Even though you've got the hypocrite next to you in the church, as it were, the Pharisee, yeah, he's a hypocrite, but I'm, I'm worse than him. I'm the sinner. He's a hypocrite or not, but he's better than me. See? This is the point. <clears throat> so he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Under the mighty hand of God. This is a quotation from Deuteronomy 3.24 in the Septuagint. And the context there is of Moses resisting the mighty hand of God. He says, You've begun to show to your servant, to your strength, your power, and your mighty hand. I will therefore go over and see this good land that is beyond the Jordan. No. God had told him, you're not going to enter. Well, although Moses was at one point very meek, I think at the end of his life, he struggled with this. Because he says, well, your mighty hand should give me a place in the kingdom. Your mighty hand should let me go in there. All right, I sinned, blah, blah. So you see, the point is that he had not humbled himself under the mighty hand of God in that he was not recognizing that I, I have no right to be in the kingdom. I absolutely deserve condemnation and not to be in the kingdom. I think that's the point. Like us, he came to recalculate, to renegotiate in his own mind the consequences of his sin. And verse 7 is in this context. Casting all your care upon him, your anxiety, because he cares for you. Now, the idea is that God takes on my care, my anxiety. Cast that care upon him because he cares for you. Cast that anxiety on him because he's anxious for you. He takes that. But again, he's quoting from Psalm 55, 22, Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. Cast your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. The idea is that he'll carry you and your burden. What's the context in Psalm 55 when David says, Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. The whole psalm is about the consequences of his sin with Bathsheba. And his burden then was the burden of sin and the burden of consequence. He says this in Psalm 38 when he says, My sins have gone over my head as a heavy burden too heavy for me. So he says that his sin was his heavy burden. But cast your burden, when he's thinking about it, the consequence of his sin in Psalm 55, cast your burden of all your sins and the consequences of them upon the Lord, because he cares for you. And in fact, this idea of burden 
is very often used in the Old Testament to describe a message of condemnation. The burden of Damascus. Damascus shall become a, a ruined heap and so on. The burden of Moab. The burden upon the sinners in Zion and so on. Many times, a burden is a burden of condemnation, a message of condemnation. So, all these ideas, sin, my sins are a heavy burden for me. The consequences of my sin, condemnation, cast that upon the Lord. And, of course, the allusion is to Isaiah 53, verse 6, where we're told that all our sin, the weight of our sin, was laid upon him. Our burden was put upon him. That's why the Lord can say, if you're heavy laden with heavy burdens, come to me. My burden is light. I'll make take my yoke upon you, and your heavy burden will become light. I'll deal with it. So, that is why verse 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. This also is an allusion to Jesus carrying our sin. The care, the burden is sin and our anxiety about that. Now, I believe that the deepest, the deepest kind of anxiety or fear or concern that we have as believers is about my sin. Will I be saved? That is our deepest subconscious, unspoken, unarticulated fear and concern and anxiety. Will I be saved when I come to the day of judgment? And he's saying, cast that upon the Lord. All our sins are upon him. And he's saying this in the very context of saying, be humble. Because if you feel that I am the worst of sinners, but wow, that has all been dealt with, I need not fear condemnation. I am going to be saved. Well, you're not going to be proud, are you? I'm the worst, but I'm going to be saved. I've got this huge burden, this debt burden of sin, but it's been dealt with. That is the path to humility. So we look back to what we started with. How, how can I be humble? Well, this is it. Fess up and realize the depth of your own sin to the point where you can say, I'm the worst, God. I'm the worst. You've given me so much. And I've done this and I've done that. And I've wasted this and I've wasted my life. And I've not been as I should have been on this area, that area, whatever it might have been. And to believe, to trust that it is dealt with in Jesus. This is directly in the context of humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That is the root of humility. So you know, there is no switch on the side of your head that you switch on to make yourself more humble. You push yourself down with your hand on your own head. But what you can do is to engage with the cross of Jesus, who himself became humble that he might be exalted, and to get that deep sense that I am, as the, as the publican said, I am the sinner. Take the lowest seat that he might exalt you. The publican humbled himself and was exalted, Jesus says, in God's eyes. So then, this is the key to humility, to being convicted of sin. Now, I realize what I'm saying in this postmodern world is, is not popular. You go to church to be told, you're awesome. Oh, you're wonderful. Yeah, we are wonderful in Christ. And of course, it's a whole multidimensional picture. I mean, we, we're not to be continually dumbed down and made to feel awful about ourselves, etc. But... There is an element of that. And it's only by coming down that low in self-recognition, in self-understanding, and really feeling, I'm the worst. And yeah, if you leave it there, well, you haven't got the point. 
but and then believing that that is forgiven, that that burden of fear, of anxiety, of care, he has taken care of that. That is what will give you the humility arising from your knees in prayer, believing that, wow, you, t you really have done it, you really have forgiven me. Then we will walk humbly in that spirit. But the problem is, you've got to not just come down when you've got a crisis or when you're confronted by your sins, and then over time, as I think happened with Moses at the end of his life, and sort of renegotiated in your mind, yeah, well, I did it because of this, or well, because of that, or well, yes, I did it, but well, that was because of all these background factors, and me, poor kid, I, I got, you know, just carried away with it, and well, so I did what I did, but poor kid, that's how I was. But oh, I'm not a bad kid in my heart. No, no, you see, you've got to come down and stay down. That's the point. And then you will walk with God. Now, this is why we regularly break bread. And not just when we break bread, but regularly, not just day by day, but almost hour by hour. We need to keep this connection with the cross, with me standing before him there. He did that for me, the just for the unjust. He came down and quite rightly was exalted very, very highly. And that V pattern is what we're all on. We're still coming down. And it's, uh, as I say, it, it's hard to get the, get the balance right. There has to be this conviction of sin. Yes, we miserable sinners. Yes, that is how we are. If you just leave it there, well, yes, it's all very negative. You just feel him, go to church, feel bad about yourself. Well, no. The whole point is that when you get down there, the good news is, when you're down there, the good news is you're forgiven. It is dealt with. Cast that care, that anxiety, that fear of condemnation. Put that on the Lord. He bore our sins. Come to me, you who are heavy laden. David, my sins are heavier than I can, I can carry. They're a heavy burden for me. Okay, cast that burden upon the Lord and he will carry you and that burden. It is dealt with. This is not a case of waiting to the day of judgment to see if this is true. This is now. Life is now. This is right now that we can know that forgiveness, that you can feel it right inside you, that you know it. And yet you've got to make a conscious effort. That's why he says, humble yourselves. Put on the apron of humility to serve as the Lord served in washing the disciples' feet. Putting himself down as the lowest slave. This was the work of the lowest servant to wash the feet of the visitors. And he says, as I have done to you, so you are to do to each other. And a new commandment I give to you, in that context he says it, to love as I have loved you. And he got right down. And this is the point. And as I say, humility is in the context of our relationships with persons. You are invited to the banquet. You take the lowest seat, not one that's halfway down, but the lowest. And then you will be exalted. The publican, God have mercy upon me, the sinner, saying that in earshot of the other bloke who's saying, thank you, that I'm not like this dirty publican, hypocrite, or the rest of it. But still, you know, that's what he said, that's what he thinks, but I am the sinner, I'm worse than him. And it's, you know, all that is within us by nature cries out against that. But, but that's not true. But I'm actually better than him. He, it's awful to be like that. No. You see, this is the point. And this is where, this is where true relationship is achieved in ecclesia, that is in church. When you get a group of people together, it can be four or five of you, or whatever, who are all genuinely like that. <laughs> that's a wonderful community to be in just a few of you who are genuinely like that 
Brother, sister, let me sin. Let me be the Christ to you. Let's thank God. Heavenly Father, we come to you taking this bread as the communion of the body of Christ, thanking you for him. And we do really pray that you will help us to allow ourselves to be convicted of both our sin and of his eternal salvation of us so that we might live in humility but with joy knowing that our heavy burden has been dealt with and to walk humbly with you our God for Jesus sake Heavenly Father, as we stand and sit here at the table of your Son, we do feel that I should be given the lowest place. But we thank you, Father, that we are here and that the cup of blessing from his holy hand is extended even to me. And we do take it, Father, as it were with both hands, with gratitude and with marvel at your grace. We pray, Father, that we might abide in him and that we might walk in humility and clothe ourselves with humility and, as he did, serve one another for his sake.